Here we are. Uh, some of you at times wonder how it is that uh, Tim is even still alive, and not for health reasons alone. Uh, we have stories and stories of, uh, about Tim and his escapades, and so I'm going to tell you another one. Um, and you're going to shake your head. It's a simple one, but it's got a message. And, uh, I mean, John is forever, and Eric are forever wondering, how's Dad alive? Uh, angels have to work hard. See, I have a, a revolving group of angels. You guys don't. You don't need them, but I have a revolving, because they go to God and they say, we can't handle him anymore, so let us move on to somebody else. Copycat. And I, my angels, they get old, fat, and gray real fast, or maybe just old real fast, and they want, they want somebody else, because mine, um, they just shake their heads. And every time, for example, every time I get on the motorcycle, John just shakes his head. How is it he's still alive? But John takes care of my bike. He does all the maintenance, the services, so the bike's always safe. And that's half the battle if you've got a safe bike. So that's half the battle. The rest of it is I just got to watch out for you people. And then I'm fine. Now with the snowbirds here, I really have to watch out for you people. So that's half the battle. But I also find myself getting into predicaments of my own making. For example, the wife. <laughs> Careful, Marina's here with Ralph. No, they left. Oh, they left already. Okay, they left already. Okay. Uh, here's the deal. I've been trying to train our youth, and our big people, but I've been trying to train our youth that if you get an opportunity to share, in any capacity, the gospel, that's God opening the doors. Mm -hmm. But even if you don't share the gospel, but you get the opportunity to make somebody's day, take it. Amen. Walk through that door. And so I take any opportunity I can to walk through that open door. And I don't care what the, uh, the, what the sort of set of circumstances are. You will make someone's day, but maybe you'll make your day. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Some of you do. So I, I take a lot of drugs, as you all know. I have to for medical reasons. So I belong to Kaiser. So I have to go to Kaiser several times a month. And I can't just get everything all at once. I have to go because they're on different dates. Okay, whatever. So there's a, there's a uh, huge office right off the freeway that I have to go to. And a lot of people also have to go there. And uh, everybody has to have a mask on from the parking lot all the way into the offices and everything else. So you don't recognize anybody. At any rate, there was an individual of color. And he was also walking at the same time I was to get to the uh, office. I opened the door to let him in first. He's wearing a Mets baseball cap. Now, I don't follow sports like I used to. How many of you follow baseball? Okay. Then you are aware of what the Mets just did a few, oh, within this last week. They signed a pitcher from the Dodgers, signed him away for the largest contract in the in Major League Baseball. And they did it just before the deadline for the lockout. Now, for those of you that don't know anything that I'm talking about, that's not the point. The point is, I told this guy, hey, you're wearing the Mets, you must be really happy. Then I notice he's crying. And he's also not in a very good mood because he's crying. And I gotta be careful what I say, because not only am I a stranger, he's, he's dressed differently as though he's a, well, he's a member of something, okay? You can tell where, I'm, where I live in that area, okay? I'm being real diplomatic about what I say. So it's really obvious. And he's got tattoos, 
and I recognize some of the tattoos, even though he's wearing a mask. I know he's also been to places where I normally don't go and haven't spent a lot of time in, okay? Uh, he's, got, he's got a teardrop. But he's also been crying for real. Now, do you know what a teardrop means? If it's been tattooed, blow your eye. You know what that means? Yep. Yep, okay. So I'm not really supposed to be talking to this guy, especially because I'm a... What's it mean? I'm not allowed to say that. Sassy. There you are. No, I can't say that word. I can't say that phrase. But at any rate, this, this guy, he is, he looks at me and says, who are you, with his eyes, who are you talking to me? And then I say to him, you just signed off and stole my picture. Max Serger for 325 million bucks. And he softens real fast, because I said, you got the Mets hat on, okay? So we got something in common. So all of a sudden now, he's, we're talking baseball, I'm an Angels fan, he says. Oh, I'm an Angels fan too. He says, and then he says, Angels don't know nothing, do they? No, they don't know how to sign anybody. See, now we're engaging in a conversation. He'd been crying, and now all of a sudden we're engaged in a conversation. And he says, uh, um, the angels, they're not going to go anywhere again, are they? Uh, probably not. Did you know that I was there for the, for the um, initial, um, well, I was there when they decided they were going to uh, construct a stadium. Long time ago, back in the 60s. That was before I was born. And so, so he was saying, um, I've been to Angel Stadium so many times I've lost count. I love that team anyway, even though they keep losing, blah, blah, blah. And I says, um, I notice that you're not having a good day. Uh, is there anything I can do to help? He goes, uh, no, no, that's okay. And have a good one. And I'm sorry if I bugged you. He says, no, you made my day. And he walked on. So I got to thinking about that. I defused a man that's having a really bad day on a simple situation because he's wearing a baseball cap that I could, I could relate to. You never know if you're gonna, if you're gonna make a difference in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to share with you, especially you young people, if you get the opportunity to share, it doesn't matter. You may not be able to share the gospel, but the door may open, okay? The door may open, and you never know when you're going to make somebody's day. I'm not saying get yourself in a bad situation, but see, I, I got an advantage over you. I'm an old man. Mm -hmm. And so old men, old people, a lot of times they, they, they forgive you, you know? They give you the benefit of the doubt. I know that. You know, they, they think, well, you're crazy anyway, so yeah, I'll just put up with you for a few moments, you know, and then you leave and I'll never have to worry about you. Yeah, and if you're younger, yeah, well, they, they're going to, they want to, make a statement with you and, and punch your lights out. But, uh, so there's, there's advantages to being old, I know. But if you get the opportunity to say hi to somebody, you should. But then I got to thinking, is there a incident where Jesus had with someone, where he introduced himself to somebody? Can you think of an incident where Jesus did the same thing? Or something similar. The demoniac. The demoniac? Yeah. Zacchaeus up in his tree. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is another one. <clears throat> yeah, you're all on the right path. Can you think of another one? It's real familiar. It's so boring that, and you, uh, you all know it, and you all read it, the and you all know it, so yeah, you've forgotten about it. The woman at the well. The woman at the well. The woman at the well. So I invite you to open up your Bibles to John 4. It's such a, a, a familiar story, you're bored with it. But let's break it down. Let's break it down. Now, the reason I bring up my, the story that happened to me recently at Kaiser is because it could have been, it could have been, as you know, there could have been a real conflict real fast. 
And I know that. But I had another similar experience take place in Atlanta, which I won't bore you with the details over. But I, 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 took, I took a sports situation, at, also in Atlanta, and also here at, at the Kaiser in Murrieta, and I used it to my advantage just because I just used it to my advantage, just to say hi to somebody and see what would happen. It wasn't a social experiment, but it was just to say, well, maybe I'll get the opportunity to share the gospel, or maybe I'll get the opportunity to at least make somebody's day and see what happens. Now, I didn't share the gospel with that guy, but I made it because the guy had to walk off, go to a doctor's appointment. But I did make the guy's day because God opened the door to say, hmm, so maybe something else will happen down the road. And that's what you want to be doing, okay? But don't take chances like I do. The possibility for conflict was in the air, wasn't it? I don't want you taking a chance. Please understand. I don't want to read about you in the paper. You can read about me in the paper. No. But the point, you get my point. But listen to this story as we break it down. Conflict is in the air from the beginning of the Gospel of John in chapter 4. Why? Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, quote, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. And you got to understand, to the Pharisees, the growing impact of Jesus did not seem to be a good omen. And so sensing the first drafts of hostility, Jesus left Judea and started back to Galilee, verse 3. And at that point, John introduces a subtle break in the story. We're bored with the story, but there's something important about the story. But he had to go through Samaria, verse 4. In Sabbath school, Eric brought up the word remember. I'm bringing up the word but. It's a very soft word, but there it is. But there is nevertheless there's a red flag when you break it down. A flag waving, to, to me at least, slow it down, slow it down. Why? Did Jesus, strictly speaking, have to go through Samaria? Now, I can't, I can't seem, it's my fault, somebody will give me an education in computers one of these days. Eric could, but see, Eric, I frustrate Eric. Because he'll teach me, and then I forget. And then, he'll, Dad, I told you. Dad, I told you. So somebody else is going to have to teach me. Because Eric's a really good teacher, but I forget. So, one of these days, because I want to give the information to Eric, and I'd love to give you a map of Samaria. Because there's different ways to go through where Jesus needed to go. He didn't have to go through Samaria to where he needed to go. So what lies behind the notion that Jesus had to go through Samaria? It's hard to describe it because I don't have a map in front of me that I would have liked to have been able to give Eric to be able to show you. But Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. There were other routes between Judea and Galilee. There's a coastal route or there's the Jordan Valley. And I'm sorry I can't show you that. But there's other routes. So... You need to understand, observant Jews at the time of Jesus, they did not go through Samaria because they didn't want to be contaminated by contact with Samaritans. You see now why it's important for me to share that story I did with you? Yep. Why I'm not supposed to talk to a man of color? Me? I'm not, a man of, I'm not another man of color, am I? But he had a baseball cap on, and he had a, he's a Mets fan, and the Mets just did something that the Dodgers lost, and so I had something in common. That's why I took the chance. That's why I took the chance. So I, I, was, I was taking a chance, and I knew that, how, why would he get mad at me? Because, just because I'm a, what's that word, what's that phrase I'm not allowed to say? Sassy? <laughs> so, 
What does the notion of necessity seen in the phrase, but he had to mean? See, I had to talk to that guy. I had to. He's crying. I didn't know why. He didn't really tell me why, but I had to. I had to talk to the guy. So what does it mean? What does it mean? It means you need some work. Well, in the God, yeah, but in the Gospel of John, Jesus never, or almost never, will do things simply because the circumstances make him do it. You know that, don't you? Yeah. You know that. And I've known the task of finding some other explanation for the necessity in the story. The but, however, the but at the beginning of the verse, it really it nudged me further in a different direction. I'm, I've got to know what's going on. Maybe you do too, if you break, when, uh, if you break down the, uh, the verse and you break down the circumstances. And that's what I want to do with you this morning. There was something important enough for me in the incident to say, I want to share with you this story in a little different view to help you in everyday circumstances. Jesus has to go through Samaria, not because Samaria is on the way, but because Samaria is on his mind. And he goes there by necessity, but the necessity is in him, not in his circumstances. And so, high noon, high noon we find Jesus in Samaria. So, so we came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well, and it was about noon. I've been there. It was hot when I was there. I've been there, and it's hot. Believe me, it's hot. And there's nothing there. There's nothing there. It's a sanctuary, practically, as far as uh, a tourist site. And there's the well, and then there's ruins right by the well. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Or, Give me a drink. And his disciples, he's by himself, his disciples had gone to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And you read these five verses, and it takes about, how long did it take me to read these five verses? Not even. Not even. Yeah, 30 seconds. Okay, I'll say a minute, say 50 seconds, yeah. So let's call that the narrative, the narrative time. But how long was the actual time in this exchange? Hmm. Reconstruction is something like this. Bear with me, it's going to be worth it, I promise. Don't be bored, it's, it's worth it. Because there's a reason for this, and there's a reason why this is in the gospel. He comes to the well first. She comes alone, not expecting anyone to be there. And the situation is awkward because she's chosen the time of the day when there's not supposed to be, or there's a least chance for running into other people. And she eyes the stranger warily, just like that guy of color did to me, while Jesus does not pretend that she has not come there. Awareness of the other is the first element in the encounter. And she will complete her errand despite the stranger sitting at the well. She's already there, right? She's already there. At this point, we've got three main options, the way I broke it down. See, remember I'm breaking it down because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking therapy. I'm, I'm a therapist. That's what I have to do. In option number one, Jesus begins the conversation immediately asking for water. But he never gets any water. Have you noticed? You will as we break this, as we continue to break this down. Maybe. Because she immediately rejoins that the question is out of character with Jewish Samaritan relations. In option number two, remember there's three options I'm giving you. She lowers the bucket to get her water before anything is said. And this takes time. Because as she will say moments later, the well is deep. You know how deep it is? Any idea? 
Any of you been, any anybody else been there? Well, we've got a well digger actually in this congregation. It's not the it's not the kind of well that he normally would dig, but he can give you an idea how deep it is to, to take a bucket down to the well where the water is, and it's it is today, and it's probably similar to what it was in those days, 125 to 240 feet deep by various estimates. Wow. Yeah. So I won't embarrass the the congregational member. But it would take a little bit of time to get that bucket down to the water, wouldn't it? At 125 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we were take a tape measure, for those of you that don't know how long 125 to 240 feet is, it, would I be all right to say, John, uh, between here and the uh, front door of the church? Maybe a little more. Maybe a little more. See, that gives you some perspective. Okay? For those of you that want to know how, how, how deep that well would be, just so you have an idea, especially young people. Okay. <clears throat> Ten minutes, perhaps more, might have transpired before anyone says anything as that bucket is being dropped into the well to get the water. Okay. In option three, he asked for... Jesus, that is, asked for water right away, and she proceeds to lower the bucket, saying nothing until she has the water. Now, of these three options, the first one is the weakest, even though this is the option that most is most faithful to the text. Do I need to, do I need to tell you what the option number one is again? You all understand what the option number one is? You've forgotten it already. <laughs> yeah, you forgot it already, didn't you? Option number one was the one where he asked for the water, but he never gets in it because she immediately starts to talk about um, the Jewish-Samaritan relations. Okay, that's the first one. Okay, so, um, and that's the one that most people believe. It's most faithful to the text. But in this option, the narrative time equals actual time. Now, I'm breaking this all down for you, for, and there's a reason why. Within less than a minute of the woman's arrival, there, there will be a conversation about water first, and then about living water. And indeed, option number one is implausible because that option allows him to ask something of her, but not for her to do something for him. Option number two or three are better because they allow time for confidence building for confidence building. When I was talking to Met, Met's man, I had to, well, we'll get to that in a moment. We'll get to that in a moment. I go with the section, second option. She gets the water first. Not until that point does he ask, give me a drink. And he pauses in the conversation as she gives him water and he drinks it with an expression of gratitude. And only then, when she's done something for him, and there's a sense of parity, then in the relationship, does she ask him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Now, by now, there's going to be some time involved. It may be 15 minutes into the encounter, and so far, words have been few, but communication is not only by words. Did you know that? Body language. Body language. Have you been... Let me go off base for a moment. Have any of you been... I don't watch TV, but I read. I read a lot. And I recognize a lot of what I read I have to pay attention to because not all of it is true. They call that fake news. But I, I have a degree in journalism, so I know what to look for and break it down. That's why I can break this down. Uh, there's a story about a, a movie production that went bad, called, a movie called Rust. And the photographer, main photographer, was shot and killed. 
in a very, very tragic accident. And one of the actors was a guy named Baldwin. And I don't know if you're following that story or not, but he, it's a guy named Alec Baldwin. And I'm following the story. I'm fascinated by the story. And I'm not making a judgment call. However, there are people that are studying the story very, very uh, seriously. And he's denying that he even shot his gun. And he's, uh, and he's denying that he had anything to do with it. And he's blaming everybody else. And uh, part of the problem is they're supposed to use dummy rounds and they're not even have, supposed to have live ammunition, and there was live ammunition in the gun uh, that killed the photographer. Now, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but what I'm trying to say is that people were studying his body language, and it's, it's, being, well, it's being stated that he's not telling the truth based on body language. Have you heard of that before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what, where I'm going with this. Body language. Jesus can be saying a lot to this woman. The woman can be saying a lot to Jesus. I see you. You know? By expression. By body language. And so that's what's probably happening even as she's getting the water from the well. 125 feet, it takes a while to get that water. So they're still communicating even if there's not that many words being expressed. Okay, so there's facial expression, there's eye contact, or there's an avoidance of eye contact. And guess what else? This is one that I'm real big with. Tone of voice. Have you ever heard of that one? That's a big one. That's a big one. Tone of voice. Okay, it takes about 30 seconds to read the story from the text, doesn't it? Minus the historical elements and the circumstantial matters, and trust cannot be built in 30 seconds, can it? It cannot. You cannot build trust in 30 seconds with anybody, can you? Okay, Diego, yeah, you, you had love at first sight with Kian, I know. Yeah, it was love at first sight. Okay, so that's the exception. Okay, I know. I know, that's, okay, so I'm wrong. But we're well advised to settle for the 15 minutes or so of actual time before we proceed. Okay, let's break it down that way. Okay, uh, despite Diego. It, that doesn't count. Okay, so, but there's three huge barriers that we that have been overcome in, in the span of the first 15 minutes or so. In 15 minutes and not 15 seconds. Let's just break it down that way. First, a Jew talks to a Samaritan, breaching the socio-ethnic barrier. I did the same thing with that man of color because of that Mets hat. Second, a man talks to a woman. That's breaching the gender barrier. Okay? And third, a pious person talks to a sinful person, breaching the moral or religious barrier. And the latter point assumes the traditional view of a woman as a questionable character, a view that's got to suffice for now. We have to accept that, because that's what the text says. Even though there are other plausible constructs for her life story. And, and I share this as a pastor, but also... I. I, I share this as an OT. I'm, I'm, I'm observing this from an OT perspective because I can't work with a patient whom I'm going to hurt when I'm doing rehab so they can get better. I'm going to break them down so they can get better, if that makes sense. And if you're my patient, that would eventually make sense. I have to establish trust. The relationship that I, I have with my patient has to be based on trust. You're not going to get it in 30 seconds. Jesus had to do the same thing. He had to get that woman's trust, especially he a Jew. It's not going to be done in 15 seconds, 30 seconds. It's going to be done based on a relationship 
It's going to be done by the body language. It's going to be done on the relational time spent as he's waiting for that cup of water. And so trust in turn is built less by how well we talk than by how we do what? Listen. 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 Now, let me get let me get let me get into an embarrassing situation based on Thursday night and Friday with the Ortiz family. I'll bet you listened mostly, Ceci. You listened a lot, didn't you? Thursday night and Friday. You listened. I watched you. I watched you. You listened, didn't you? You probably saw people you hadn't seen in a long time. Didn't you? Maybe not. But I get the feeling you hadn't seen some of those people for a while. You listened. That was what was important. Regaining the relationship that you hadn't had for a long time. You listened. And that's the difference. Jesus is doing the same thing. Jesus is doing the same. And on this point, the account confirms trust in making when the woman decides to engage in a conversation. And that's what you probably did as well. You're not there taking over, are you? You're listening. I realize it's an emotional situation. But you're not taking over, you're listening. Same thing that Jesus is doing. Engaging in a conversation that could have been avoided. Jesus could have just done nothing. And it's not hard to imagine her, what could she have been doing? What would she like to have done in that, set of, in that circumstance? Get Think about this. Get out of there. Get out of there, thank you. Get out of there as quickly as possible, right? That's a Jew. I don't want to be around that guy. I want to get out as fast as I can. And her hurrying away from the well without saying a word to the stranger would have been what she wanted to do. Instead, what happens? She went and brought people. Back up for a moment, though. She stays to talk. Same thing I did with that guy that would not want to give me the time of day but would have liked to have cut me up, which he probably could have done. But he had a Mets hat. And he just got the picture of the year on his team sign, even though he's an Angels fan. So I defused the situation. And he's crying. So. Maybe he's not going to, that's not his first thought, is to cut me up. But under normal circumstances, if we'd been in an alley, he would have. Especially the way he's dressed and the tattoos. I'm telling you the truth. But it was all diffused. And I didn't come, I didn't come at him to hurt him. And I came, I, with body language, I came, Nets hat, baseball, how cool is that? You, you, guys are, you guys are headed for the World Series next year. You got the picture of the year. See what I'm saying? And triggered by this simple question and reinforced by hers, the conversation is going to be one for the ages. And that's why it's in Scripture. This story, which everybody's bored with, ends up being really important. Why? So we have to speed up from here with only three additional points from the story itself. And we move from his need to her need, from her water to his water. Keep going on the verses. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying it to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water, Jesus says, verse 10. She doesn't quite get the point. But she gets the hint that she has a need and that God has a remedy for it. And on the premise of her need and his remedy, she declares, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Verse 15. And at that point, the conversation shifts gears. 16 to 18. Go call your husband and come back. This might seem like a change of subject, but it's not. 
What could be better than living water to bring an end to the trips to the well at high noon all by herself as a person ostracized from her community? She doesn't understand the notion of living water yet, but she feels the appeal of getting water that quenches a person's thirst to such an extent that, no, that one no longer has to make the trip to the well. And I don't think... She, I don't think we need to think that she's, she's prepared for Jesus' statement, but the statement is not unrelated to the woman's situation in life. So keep that in mind. Because what does she answer with? I have no husband. Her denial could have been the end of the conversation. You have to understand that. Certainly it could have gotten her to leave. She doesn't leave though, does she? Jesus allows time for her to do so, I think. He doesn't proceed until he's certain that she will not leave, I think. He can only say that what he will say next when he's confident of having earned her trust to the point of no return. He doesn't insult her. You've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband, he says, adding. And what you've said is true. Verse 18. And I think it's daring but necessary and ultimately really helps the conversation and the circumstance. Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't waste words, does he? He's not going to say anything that's not necessary. He'll never insult somebody. We do it all the time. Spouses do it all the time. They don't even think about it until after the fact. <clears throat> We, and then we have to apologize. Jesus doesn't do that. How he says it as well, and how we say things, matters more than what he said. Again, I think there's a pause on her part, and it's likely now that all is out in the open. All the truth is out. Well, she's thinking, he knows everything about me, and I don't know anything about this guy yet. That's what's going on in this text. That's what's opening up in the text, and that's why it becomes so important. This boring story becomes so important as, as, as a result. And what now? And she says, I see now that you're a prophet. Verse 19. Now, in the Greek text, there's a period after her concession, a necessary pause that comes with the period, and it's got to be supplied by you and I. And there's this pause that's necessary for probably several minutes. This just this doesn't go, oh, that hurts. It doesn't go bam, bam, bam. It doesn't do that, okay? And I don't share the widely held view that she wants to change a subject and rushes to do so. Noted already, verbal pauses do not mean absence of communication. We've already established that because of body language. But if her body language at this point is apprehensive and questioning, which I don't think it is, but maybe, maybe, what do you think Jesus is? What do you think his body language is? Calm. Even keel. Accepting. Even keel. Yeah, Eric, you're right. But accepting. Accepting. And it's not threatening. Not threatening. It's reassuring. That's what I think it is. Reassuring. If there's eye contact, I think there is, if there's eye contact, she's not looking into a judgmental man. She's not looking at a man who's being judgmental. Well, you've got five husbands. How are you, how, now, nah, let's not go there. I could, but I'm not going to. So, there's been this wonderful progression in this conversation, in her view, I think, of him. Up to this point, <clears throat> from how can you, a Jew, in her opening bid, as she acknowledges Jesus as an, ex you know, he's an exceptional human being, isn't he? I mean, this guy is amazing. Why would he want to talk to me? This guy is amazing. And it goes on positive notes from there. Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? See, Jacob is uh, considered like a semi-god to the Samaritans. That's in the history. That's, that's 
and they live in that land of Jacob, that well is sacred, and it still is, by the way, and it's still functioning, by the way. She recognizes him as a great spiritual figure. I see that you're a prophet. So she knows that he's important. And she places Jesus in an even higher spiritual category than Jacob. And the progression in her view, keep stepping up, of him has not run its course yet. She resumes the conversation, asking the prophet's um, adjudication of the dispute between the Jews and the Samaritans as to the correct place for worship, only to have Jesus answer that neither Jerusalem or Samaria means anything in the new reality that's breaking on in the world, verses 20 to 24. And only at that moment does she strike, responding as though the definitive answer to her question has to be deferred to a, a point in the future. I know that Messiah is coming. See, she, she believes the Messiah is coming, she says. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Verse 25. She's a believer. And that sentence would have been a fitting ending to the conversation. The signal that she should realize the time has come for her to leave. Okay? But... She does not leave even though there might have been another moment of silence. And it, I think we can hardly imagine that Jesus could have made his subsequent assertion except for the fact that it had entered the possibility for her that he, the stranger at the well, might possibly be the Messiah. See, that's why this is important. I am he, the one who is speaking to you, Jesus says to her. Verse 26. And what does she do? I'll tell you what she doesn't do. She doesn't say, I don't believe you, does she? She doesn't say that. She doesn't scoff at the uh, claim, does she? When the, and then, guess what happens? The disciples, they come into play. Oh, man, why did you guys have to show up? <laughs> you know, they reemerge in the story. No further conversation between the two is possible. You know, why did you guys have to show up? And the disciples, of course, they're puzzled, aren't they? It's like, dudes, go away. You know? And they're puzzled seeing Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. Verse 27. And she quite forgets the reason why she came to the well in the first place. I don't think she ever got the water. I don't think Jesus ever got a drink. But now she's got a story to tell. Just like Met, Met Man. He's got, this white guy came, this white dude came up to me. You know? Made my day. Talked to me and made my day. She's got a story to tell. Come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? She says to her fellow villagers, and there must have been excitement in her voice and body language. And there must have been more than just a little surprise on their part that the Samaritan woman suddenly and willingly makes everything I've ever done. She admits it. It's like she's a public testimony, a public confession, a subject of attention and conversation. And her willingness to draw attention to her life record increases the likelihood that she was not trying to change the subject when Jesus brought it up. That's why I bring that up, by the way. And rather, the conversation between her and Jesus, between her and Jesus, ends up being really, really important. And it, I imagine, an element of condescension in the disciples' demeanor. It's like the disciples don't get it. Why are you speaking with her? Verse 27. And she nevertheless will be the first to win Samaria. Not, not the disciples, not his disciples, by the way. See, God will use anybody. That's why young people, I say, don't give up. God will use anybody. He will use you. He used that Samaritan woman, didn't he? God uses anybody. He didn't just use his disciples, by the way. And for the men in the story, four months remain until harvest. For Jesus, by contrast, the fields are ripe for harvesting. 
Verse 35. And the woman is proof of his thesis and the means to bring it in. Their lack of interest in Samaria is surpassed only by their lack of respect for her. You know where I'm going with that? And how to resolve this question in our time may be nudged to its inevitable destination by ascribing to Jesus the prerogative to reveal principle and prescribe policy. By that I mean, I know that Messiah is coming, says the Samaritan woman in her attempt to postpone the moment of truth. Of all, of all the compelling images in the story, perhaps the most riveting, I think, is the scene of Jesus sitting alone at the well at the point when the disciples return and the woman has left, his face, I think, exuding contentment. And Rabbi eats something, the disciples say, thinking of his physical hunger. I have food to eat that you do not know about, he answers. And they wonder if someone else has brought up food. They don't have a clue. But Jesus speaks of food of a different order. His deepest need has been met in the encounter with the Samaritan woman. And I share with you, when you share the gospel or you share a good word with somebody else, you end up getting the benefits. Amen. You end up getting the benefits. Don't let an opportunity pass you by. And young people on the in the classroom, on the playground, or at work if you got a new job, even if it's at McDonald's, it's going to make a difference. It really will. And parents, if, uh, if your kids are not at, at church today because of circumstances, Eric is videotaping, and we will upload it or whatever the word is. Let him see this. Let him see this. Finally, we've got to win a person's confidence before we can do anything else. We win a person's confidence, and it begins with interest in that person. To overcome prejudice, distrust, and the fracturing realities of convention, it does take time, and this also takes ingenuity and planning. Hey, you got a Mets hat on. See what I'm saying? Probably wouldn't have even, I would have said hi to the guy as I was opening the door because I'm, I'm trying to be polite like that. He's got a Mets hat on. Ingenuity. See what I'm talking about? And I see elements of this in Jesus' journey from Judea to Galilee, arriving at the well at high noon. He did it on purpose. And when he will see her one-on-one, -on -one, and by the fact that he breaks the ice by asking her for a favor. And ministry is, in this regard, no different from medical ministry. That's what I did as an OT. I did that all the time. But confidence building knows no shortcuts. You gotta do and you gotta think this stuff through. Confidence building knows no shortcuts. Programs we launch and the books we yearn to distribute will not do much good unless we've won the trust of the recipient. I wanted to share that, well, Ralph knows all about that. And I believe Marina probably has gone with him. So he, she could tell us about it too. They, I guess they've left. Yeah. But, they, but they would be able to tell us volumes about that. It doesn't do any good unless you gain their confidence. And endeavors can, in the absence of trust, actually cause more harm than good. But most important, however, is the answer to the question which we began with. Why did he have to go through Samaria? Geography is not the reason. He went there because of deeper needs, hers and his. What Jesus longs for from this woman, even more than delicious spring water, is that she long for the living water that he longs to give her. Amen. I found that in an essay. I can't give you the credit because I don't remember. I wrote it down. Maybe it's somewhere from Ellen White. I apologize. I don't know where it came from. I just had it written down. For many who have written on the scene at the Samaritan well, for many who have written on this scene, this boring scene, the woman's oblivion to her own need, assumed to be so much greater than that of Jesus, is the pivot on which the irony of their dialogue turns. Deeper by far, however, is the irony of Jesus' own need, not to mention that of his father is just as great as the woman's. The well is deep, as the woman says, 
Desire, however, is bottomless. As I close, the encounter begins with his need for her water, then this encounter moves to her need for his water, but then in a moment of splendid clarity, that's what I call it, just clarifies everything, the encounter returns to his need for her. And his bottomless desire drives the entire story, and that's the reason why he had to go through Samaria. I broke it down for you, a boring story, but I wanted to share that with you. Please, if you get the opportunity to share anything that might have to do with sharing Jesus with somebody else, Amen. walk through the door. Walk through the door. You don't know how much you're going to make somebody's day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm thirsty. Everyone here in this room is thirsty. Please, we want the living water that you provide. And we never want to be thirsty again. I know that each one of us wanted to uh, learn to love you more. And we want to be close to you. I'm asking you open our minds and hearts. And just envelop us. Drown us, as it were. We really want your love today. And on this Sabbath day, we can renew our relationship with you in that special way, because that's what you gave us the Sabbath for. I pray that we can think about you all throughout the day, realize how much you've been part of our week. It's been a trying week for this church, for all of us, uh, the Ortiz family in particular. But more importantly, you've been with us, you've been with them, you've been with us as a source of peace, as source of comfort uh, through your Holy Spirit and you will continue to be with us. And I ask that uh, you continue to show us how to live, <coughs> draw us close to you, and as Sabbath School continues to show, Eric brought it up, trust and trust and trust, and then I think I heard the word obey once or twice too. And everything works out. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Please watch over us. I know angels, again, work overtime. Give me my new angels. I'll try not to uh, overwhelm them this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.